Alrighty, Cherub, so we're going to do the New Kingdom today. Woo. Good stuff. Okay, so we remember from the Old Kingdom, um, Egypt was a long, continuous nation. Okay, they, their customs, their art remained the same virtually for most of its history. There are going to be some changes from kingdom to kingdom, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Okay, make sure you take your quiz in the uh, next page down below. Um, remember, hit these, talk about who they are, what they are, how they talk about immortality. And that theme of the quest for immortality is going to continue today. All right. So today's pieces, we've got two temples and a papyrus scroll. Okay. So whereas we had tombs last time, We've got temples today, and that's going to be one of the big changes from the Old Kingdom up into the New Kingdom. Old Kingdom built giant tombs and little temples. By the time we get to the New Kingdom, they're building massive temples and little tombs. And the reason for the little tombs is what we talked about last time, is that you have a big, when you've got a giant tomb, you've got a big neon sign saying, hey, grave robbers, here's all the good stuff right here. And they didn't uh, want to keep doing that because that leads to disruption of the universe and uh, pillaging, and they didn't want that. So they flipped it by the time of the New Kingdom and are creating these massive, massive temples and little hidden tombs. <clears throat> for a brief reminder on the uh, myth of Osiris and why it's important in the New Kingdom, I'm going to post this video down below. Okay, uh, so 18th, 19th, 20th dynasties are the New Kingdom. And they're going to be a period of, like, of greatest expanse. In the New Kingdom, they're going to... Um, go outside of Egypt and up into uh, the Levant, up into the Fertile Crescent just a little bit, take the uh, Palestine and expand beyond their borders. And they're going to go down south too. So they're going to reach their, their greatest extent. Um, again, the temple is going to be the most important of the New Kingdom buildings. Let me grab my laser here. The temple is going to be the most important of the New Kingdom buildings. And um, it should also be noted that the role of the pharaoh is going to change slightly because we're going to be getting a new priest class that's going to gain in importance and power. We're also going to change um, capitals. Okay, So in the Old Kingdom... The capital was Memphis, which is just right next to present-day Cairo. So it was all the way up here in Lower Egypt, okay? Giza's right there as well. Saqqara, okay, some of these great sites of the Old Kingdom. In the New Kingdom, we're going to be moving the capital down to a city called Thebes right here so it's way down the Nile and this is going to be the the new capital city of the new kingdom um, also we're going to be getting a new god okay we're gonna be getting this guy this is Amun Amun is going to uh, he's a he's a sky god and he's got these, looks like rabbit ears, but they are feathers on top of his crown. Okay. Amun is going to be, um, again, a sky god. But they're going to combine him with Ra. All right. So we've got Amun and we've got Ra. And they're going to combine, they're going to moosh them together to make a new guy. Amun-Ra. Okay, so Amun-Ra is going to be the sky and the sun and all of 
the heavenly connotations rolled into one being. And he's going to appear like this. He's not going to have a falcon head anymore. But he's still going to retain the sun disk. He's also going to um, have a priestly class. Okay, a class of a large army of priests that help to, to maintain his uh, holy sites because he's going to have lots of them. And they're going to wield a lot of political power, okay, to rival the pharaoh. So they can, they can um, exert their, their pull and their influence, and, um, and they do, uh, and get things done the way they want them in the kingdom because they've, got, they've amassed so much power. So now for some fun architectural terms. Before we dive into our pieces, we've got we haven't had an architectural flashcard in a minute. Sorry, we're gonna I'm gonna throw a whole bunch at you today. So there we go. Our first one are columns. Okay, a column is a stone pillar, helps to hold up a roof. Hopefully you knew that already. Now in Egypt, they're making them look like papyrus or lotus blossoms. Okay. And this is going to become important later with the Greek. So you can see that they are these closed buds up here up at the top, and there are the, the shafts of the plant, and they're bound together. Okay? And so they carve them to look like a bundle of these closed flowers, these closed lotuses, or the papyruses, the papyrus plants um, in bloom. Okay? So they're going to have these columns and they're going to be massive they're just everything in new kingdom is big enormous to show the the strength and the power of the kingdom okay so we have columns now what you do with the columns that's going to become important here when you have a column a row of columns that's called a colonnade okay it's called a colonnade. Oh, back up. So we got column, pillar of stone. The top of the column is called the capital. Okay. The Greeks are going to have their own capitals. And when we talk about the Greeks, we'll talk about their capitals. But again, in Egypt, they're using natural forms, lotus papyrus. So we got column, capital, Row of columns, colonnade. Now, I'm just going to give you some terms just so that you're familiar with them as we roll into Greece and Rome. When you have a row of arches, now the arch isn't going to be invented until we get to Rome, but when we have a row of arches supported by columns, it's called an arcade. Colonnade, arcade. Make sense? Now, when you have columns, when you have a colonnade that go around the perimeter of a space, that's called a peristyle. And you know that because it's peri, like a perimeter, right? It's a row of columns that extends around the perimeter of an open space. This is a Roman thing. We'll get to it later. And when you have a forest of evenly distributed columns, that's called a hypostyle. So a peristyle goes around the outside edge, the perimeter. A hypostyle goes, it just fills in the whole space. Okay? So it's a forest of evenly spaced columns. The Egyptians are going to be the first people to do this. And when you have um, in their sanctuaries, then you're going to have a row of windows to let in light, and that's called the Clara story. Okay, Clara story, right here. You got that Clara story, you got the hypostyle hallway. All right, now that's gonna become important uh, in just a minute. As is this piece, we're gonna be getting this, which is called a ceremonial gate, or it's, it's called a pylon, it's a ceremonial gate. Okay, and you can see that it, it, they're trapezoidal in shape, these represent the horizon, okay, where the sky meets the earth. That's what the pylon represents. 
and the obelisk huh, is going to be used often in conjunction with with the pylon. We're going to see it with the pylon here in just a second. But again, we're getting that pyramid up at the top, so that's the Ben Ben, that's the primordial earth, but then the shaft, again, the whole thing's phallic, okay, uh, king's power, that sort of thing, but it's also a petrified sun ray, okay? So it has multiple layers of meaning. We're getting this, um, uh, the fact that it is a Ben Ben, that it represents the king's uh, virility, his, his masculinity, as well as light from the sun, okay? So the obelisk, and we're going to see one in just a second. So our first piece now is this, and this is the Temple of Amun-Ra at Karnak, okay? This is the Temple of Amun-Ra at Karnak, or the Karnak Temple. You can see that it's an axis mundi. Right? It was built in the 18th and the 19th dynasties. So it's going to go for, they're going to be hmm, building it for 300 years. Mud, brick, and sandstone. All right. You can see here pylons. You can see here hypostyle hallway. You can see here obelisk. Okay, now the Karnak Temple is massive. It's one of the largest religious complexes on the planet. Um, it, it's enormous because they're going to be adding on to it. Uh, each king is going to be adding on to it. They want to want to impress upon the people, impress the people with their faith and devotion to Amun Ra. Okay, that's going to be super important. And also to getting good with the gods. You know, like, okay, see, I was, I was a good guy. I was a good person. I added to your glory. So it's a, it serves the, the pharaoh a double purpose to impress themselves upon the gods and also onto the people. Now, the other pictures associated with the Temple of Karnak are the hypostyle hallway here. So you, here you can see the forest of massive columns and the people compared to them. So these are enormous. And you, I mean, it would take many people linking hands to um, encircle one of these columns. These aren't baby little columns. These are huge. And here we're getting our clerestory window up top story window okay so you can see the different capitals that the Egyptians are using all right the bud um, capitals and the flowered the open capitals the papyrus capitals okay um, the hypostyle hallway was the okay let's let's go back let's go back the whole thing, and this is just a shot of, again, part of it, and you can see how different pharaohs are going to be adding on different sections to this massive structure. But again, this is just a part of it. It extends out the sides, too. But here's the main part. You can see that the uh, temple is shaped rectangularly. Okay, It's an axial plan, which means it rotates on an axis. So it has a center line that goes down the middle and essentially it's symmetrical okay it's rectangular that's going to become important we're going to hear that term again and again so if an axial planned building exists it's a rectangle with a center avenue running down it okay um what the temple of karnak does is it replicates, and this is always indicative, there's a couple of things that are indicative of Axis Mundi. It represents the cosmos, Egyptian theology, okay? As you move through the temple, you're gonna be moving back in time. And you're going to enter the marshy reeds that were formed there at the beginning of time that grew out of the primordial water, 
okay? And you're going to be going back in time, back in time. The ground is going to rise as you get to the holy cella, the holy of holies. The ground is going to rise, and the roof is going to go in. So the back, the holy of holies, is going to be um, a small chamber that is very dark. It only has one illuminated spot, and it illuminates the statue of the God, okay? And at the beginning of the world. So you've entered the primordial waters, you've entered the reeds, the, the first things that grew around the Ben Ben until you finally get to the, the primordial, the point of creation, the Ben Ben with the creator God, okay? Does that make sense? I hope that helps you're moving into more and more and more sacred spaces. And ancient temples do this frequently, where the outer stuff is for less initiated people. And as you move in, you have to have a higher rank to be able to get in. So in the Holy of Holies, it's only like the high priests and um, the Pharaoh himself that can go in there and only on special occasions you don't waltz in there again this is not for congregational worship okay um different layers are accessible to different people different um levels of priests so again many ancient cultures are going to do this the jews are going to do this uh, early christians are going to do this so we we see this thing happening again and again okay so the Karnak Temple as the Axis Mundi, it's basically just re restating what I just said. Um, it's the, it recreates the moment of creation, okay? It recreates the universe for the, uh, for the Egyptians. All right, take a little tour of the Karnak Temple. So here you can see those uh, pylons. We're walking down the Avenue of Sphinxes. The ceremonial gate there, which represents the horizon. Pass through the first pylons. There's many layers of pylons. Um, the colonnade. And each layer of pylons was going to be added by a new pharaoh. Okay, here we're entering a hypostyle hallway, not the only one. You can see the light entering in with the, the uh, Clara story window. Again, it's getting darker. It's getting darker because you're entering, uh, you're going back into the, re the far reaches of time. You're going to leave the hypostyle so that, again, those, those columns represent those, the first plants. You're going to leave... The hypostyle hallway, uh, obelisks, petrified sunlight, more pylons, walk through, and it all would have been heavily decorated and painted. Okay, keep walking. And you get back, and you, as you go further back, and then you get to the um, to the Holy of Holies. All right. So our form is axial plan. Go ahead and write in rectangle as well, because it is a rectangle. That's what that means. It's a rectangle, and it's a complex of temples and uh, monumental sites dedicated to the gods. We've got our hypostyle hallway. We've got our tallest columns being papyruses, and the they look like they are bound together. Um, reeds of plants, okay? The columns are carved with a sunken relief. That means that the, the carvings are pushed in. They're below the surface of the column itself. And again, one of the largest religious complexes in the world and represents the Egyptian cosmology. Okay, so this one's important. How does this compare uh, to the white temple in its ziggurat. How is it similar and how is it different? Think about that for a second. Okay, now as we move on, we're going to, so here is, um, here's Thebes, here's Karnak, okay? And here we're getting 
just near those sites, Jaser Jasero. Jaser Jasero is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, New Kingdom, 18th Dynasty, 1473 to 1458, sandstone, and it's going to be carved into the cliff. It's going to be built out of the cliff and then carved into the hillside. Hatshepsut was a ruler. She was at first the, the regent monarch for her stepson um, when her husband passes. Because her husband is the pharaoh. He dies. And so her stepson is supposed to become the king, but he's a child. So she rules um, by his side. Okay? By his side. Uh, in his stead until he can come of age and she just rules outright and she makes herself um, pharaoh which causes some trouble with Maud maintaining cosmic balance because she's a lady um, and so that's gonna that we're gonna see some things happen there with that Okay, so you can see the mortuary temple. What this is, is the temple dedicated to her memory. She, she's going to build it herself, um, but it's dedicated for offerings to be given to her as she continues to maintain Ma'at in the next life. And you can see that it's a series of ramps and platforms that lead up into the hillside. Now you can see the hillside has these striations. It's got just the natural rock, uh, you know, striations of light and dark and light and dark and light and dark and that's what's happening down here in the colonnade light and dark and light and dark and light and dark it's replicating the natural world that's behind it it's replicating the mountain that's behind it okay now the mortuary temple is again a place of offerings dedicated to Hatshepsut after she's passed and it is done so that she can continue to order, you know, maintain cosmic order. But she's also going to, within its walls, delineate her achievements, okay? The things that she was able to accomplish as Pharaoh. And she was quite well accomplished. Okay, so here's our first real lady with a name that we're going to talk about um, in art history, Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut, okay? So here are some different shots of what the temple complex looked like. Now, it's all desert, obviously, now. They would have maintained gardens here. So it would have been lush. They would have imported water and grown trees and uh, maintained uh, a very, very beautiful site. Now, in the 20th century, this is how it was found. Okay, so what most of what we see is a reconstruction. People just didn't like walk into this Indiana Jones style and here's the temple. It's been restored. Okay. Many, many, many ancient sites, you have to bear this in mind, have been restored. Okay. Here it is again. So it's I mean it's much more complete now. Okay, so it's coordinated with those natural settings. Okay, it's got those terraces, it's got broad horizontals and little verticals of the colonnades to help replicate the mountain. Again, the broad horizontal. And if we check back the mountain, we're seeing these, the, the kind of the shape of the whole thing is these broad horizontals. So it's trying very hard to fit in with that natural landscape that it's built into. Okay. So again, it's a mortuary temple. You can click on these to take you to more information if you'd like. We've got three colonnaded terraces, two ramps. And it's the first time the achievements of a woman are celebrated in art history. Okay, and that's important. Um, and we're going to point them out. Because especially in the ancient world, they're few. So we're gonna, I'm going to make sure to point those guys out. This is a little bit more about Hatshepsut. Three and a half thousand years ago in Egypt, a noble pharaoh was the victim of a violent attack. 
but the attack was not physical. This royal had been dead for 20 years. The attack was historical, an act of damnatio memoriae, the damnation of memory. Somebody smashed the pharaoh's statues, took a chisel, and attempted to erase the pharaoh's name and image from history. Who was this pharaoh, and what was behind the attack? Here's the key. The pharaoh Hatshepsut was a woman. In the normal course of things, she should never have been pharaoh. Although it was legal for a woman to be a monarch, it disturbed some essential Egyptian beliefs. Firstly, the pharaoh was known as the living embodiment of the male god, Horus. Secondly, disturbance to the tradition of rule by men was a serious challenge to ma'at, a word for truth expressing a belief in order and justice vital to the Egyptians. Hatshepsut had perhaps tried to adapt to this belief in the link between order and patriarchy through her titles. She took the name Ma'at Kare and sometimes referred to herself as Hatshepsut with a masculine word ending. But apparently, these efforts didn't convince everyone, and perhaps someone erased Hatshepsut's image so that the world would forget the disturbance to Ma'at and Egypt could be balanced again. Hatshepsut, moreover, was not the legitimate heir to the throne, but a regent, a kind of stand-in co-monarch. The Egyptian kingship traditionally passed from father to son. It passed from Tutmosa I to his son Tutmosa II, Hatshepsut's husband. It should have passed from Tutmosa II directly to his son Tutmosa III, but Tutmosa III was a little boy when his father died. Hatshepsut, the dead pharaoh's chief wife and widow, stepped in to help as her stepson's regent, but ended up ruling beside him as a fully-fledged pharaoh. Perhaps Tutmosa III was angry about this. Perhaps he was the one who erased her images. It's also possible that someone wanted to dishonor Hatshepsut because she was a bad pharaoh. But the evidence suggests she was actually pretty good. She competently fulfilled the traditional roles of the office. She was a great builder. Her mortuary temple, Jesser Jesseru was an architectural phenomenon at the time, and is still admired today. She enhanced the economy of Egypt, conducting a very successful trade mission to the distant land of Punt. She had strong religious connections. She even claimed to be the daughter of the state god, Amun. And she had a successful military career, with a Nubian campaign and claims she fought alongside her soldiers in battle. Of course, we have to be careful when we assess the success of Hatshepsut's career, since most of the evidence was written by Hatshepsut herself. She tells her own story in pictures and writing on the walls of her mortuary temple and the red chapel she built for Amun. So who committed the crimes against Hatshepsut's memory? The most popular suspect is her stepson, nephew, and co-ruler, Tutmosa III. Did he do it out of anger because she stole his throne? This is unlikely since the damage wasn't done until 20 years after Hatshepsut died. That's a long time to hang on to anger and then act in a rage. Maybe Tutmosa III did it to make his own reign look stronger, but it is most likely that he or someone else erased the images so that people would forget that a woman ever sat on Egypt's throne. This gender anomaly was simply too much of a threat to Ma'at and had to be obliterated from history. Happily, the ancient censors were not quite thorough enough. Enough evidence survived for us to piece together what happened, so the story of this unique, powerful woman can now be told. Okay, so we're going to be seeing here, here's an earlier statue of Hatshepsut. Okay, she's wearing the Nemes headdress, and you can see here that she's got this very delicately pointed uh, chin, that she's got these elongated figure features, these elongated limbs, and she has breasts. Okay, so she is depicted here early on as a woman. Now, as we move on, we're going to see, now this is Hatshepsut again, and it looks very masculine. Okay, so this is one of the images that comes to us from the mortuary temple is this statue of her there's going to be multiple of these statues uh, presenting offerings to the gods okay 
and here she's portrayed as a man. She has her the the ceremonial beard and no breasts and just a lot more bulky and masculine. Okay? Again, no negative space. No negative space, but you can see where the statue has been pieced back together because it was smashed. Okay, so this is granite. Granite is a very, very hard stone. So it was deliberately, this was an accidentally crushed over time. It was deliberately smashed, and you can see that in the reconstruction here that it was put back together. Okay, quite expertly, I might add. They did a very good job. So this is one of the um, the many statues of Hatshepsut from her mortuary temple in which she's making offerings to the gods. And again, she's depicted as a man. All right? So that is um, Hatshepsut. And that is her mortuary temple at Jasera Jasera. Now, our last thing, that other video, by the way, I'll link down below. It talks about more about uh, Hatshepsut. Okay. Our last piece for the New Kingdom is the Last Judgment of Hugh Nefer. All right? Hugh Nefer was a noble. Now, again, let me back up. In the Old Kingdom, the person who would be resurrected was the pharaoh. That's pretty much it. As we move on through time, that extends to everyone. Everyone gets to be resurrected. Okay? So this is part of the Book of the Dead. It's the end scene of the Book of the Dead for a nobleman named Hugh Nefer. And this is wrong. I'm not sure. Gosh, i got to fix that. This is correct. <laughs> We've got the last judgment of Hugh Nefer. Okay? And here he is. He's being led to the throne room to judgment by Anubis. <clears throat> here we are. Here's Anubis again, weighing the heart of Hugh Nefer against the feather of Maat, Thoth, the Ibig. Ibis headed god, it's a bird, uh, of knowledge and wisdom, and he invented writing. Okay, he's taking notes, watching what happens. Amit the devourer is slavering, waiting to, to eat the, the heart and the soul, but he has denied his prize. Hugh Nefer passes, and we see him here, being led by Horus to his divine father and mother and aunt. Okay, so we can see here that um, the people are appearing multiple times. Hugh Nefer is here and here. Anubis is here and here. You're meant to read it this way. Okay. And though they're not really going to have much you can read it from other directions depending on, on who makes the scene, okay? Sometimes they're read the opposite way. And you can read uh, the glyphs, okay? The glyphs you can see are vertical. So this is called a compressed narrative. And if that's not written down in form, please write that down. It's called a compressed narrative in which we're having a figure repeat again and again, because it's showing us the movement through time. Does that make sense? So it's showing us multiple moments in time at once. I can look at this and see multiple <laughs> events happening simultaneously. So it, you're supposed to, it's supposed to be like a movie, like scene one, scene two, scene three, okay? So again, the last judgment of Hugh Nefer, his heart weighed on the scales, he passes, he's a good person, and he gets to enter into Osiris, Osiris' presence.
Now it's painted on papyrus. When you come back to class next week, I'll have some papyrus that you can touch. It's not paper. Papyrus is different than paper. Okay, paper comes from pulp and that's invented by the Chinese. This is something different. It's paper-like. It's very thin. Um, but it, it's not quite the same thing. We're going to watch a video in a bit that shows how, how it's made and why that's different than paper. Okay? So we're getting the other crouched gods up top, like watching the scene. All right. Again, broken into registers, a ground line. Look at the organization that they're displaying here. So I'm going to put this, in, I'm going to link this down below the video on how to make papyrus. Again, when you come back to class, uh, we're going to touch some. And a video that kind of walks us through this scene. Okay. So if we're taking a peek at this, we can see, again, same main players. It's the exact same scene. All right. The person that's black, we know, is this guy. It's Anubis. Oops, go back. This is Anubis. This is the character, the person being led forward. This is Osiris. This is Isis. And you can see that this is this person here, not in the other scene, but in this scene you can see, and we know why she's there. It's a lady and she's bringing him forward. Look at that feather on her head. We know that this is the goddess Maat. Okay, so Maat, cosmic order. So rather than showing us the scales of the, the heart and the feather, the feather goddess herself is leading him forward to be brought into the presence of Osiris. Okay, so does that make sense? We see these guys pop up again. So again, the Book of the Dead is a book of spells and charms that help you beat back the monsters so you can make it to your um, enjoy paradise. And those are today's pieces for the New Kingdom. Next time in class, we're going to talk about this little tiny weird little blip that happens in the New Kingdom, um, and it's called the Amarna period, where things go crazy artistically and I'm really super excited to talk to you about that. So make sure you make the flashcards for these pieces and make the flashcards for these architectural pieces. These will be on the quiz next time, all right? And make sure that you do your compare and contrast and that you take your um, final exam for prehistoric art, okay? And I'll see you next time.